congratulations to Councillor Birch for becoming a grandparent for the second time. Um, but and some of you also have work matters to attend to, so I'll ensure that we have as much discussion as possible, but don't keep going longer than needed. Do we have any apologies for absence, Nick? Um, we do via me. That's okay. Paul. Paul Griffiths um, has another meeting. Are there any declarations of interests? Great, if I can move us on then to the first major item on the uh, agenda, which is the workforce cost of living impact, which I believe uh, yourself, Rachel, Councillor Garrick, will be presenting. Absolutely. Um, shall I go forward? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, so, colleagues, um, this paper has been written by our Chief Officer for People and Governance, Matt Phillips. I'd like to thank him for that. And with this paper, we're seeking to release a total of £219,824 from reserves. And this is to mitigate principally the cost of living impact for our employees and to also ensure that we can continue to provide services for our statutory care obligations. So we're all painfully aware that we as the UK are in the throes of a cost of living and an economic crisis, which has seen our economy sink below that of India's in recent weeks. It's drastically inflated the cost of living, especially in the energy, in the context of energy and fuel. Um, within our council, our analysis shows that our lowest paid employees are on the front line of this crisis, with our care workers experiencing the highest impact due to the cost of transport, which they use to deliver our services. In terms of the cost of living inflation, the paper reiterates the CPI increase over the last 12 months to July, which is the most recently printed um, um, CPI increase, to ex um, exceeding 10%. This, forecast is, this is forecast to continue into the autumn with concerns that the peak may actually reach 15%. At the same time, fuel costs for petrol and diesel have inflated and peaked at around a 45% increase. To put that into context, after over a decade of austerity funding on public services by UK government and therefore restricted Barnet, con Barnet consequentials to Wales, our public service pay rises have been limited over the last, well, over a decade. And, was, and at the same time, HMRC tax rates for mileage have remained unchanged for over a decade. This has resulted in a very real stress around our colleagues on the lower pay bands. Our analysis of our travel expenditure as a, as a council in terms of business mileage shows that our lower band staff in grades D and E and some of an F had the largest business mileage rates in private vehicles. So our care at home total mileage is estimated at around 520,000 miles per year across <coughs> 180 employees. Of that, 415,000 miles are claimed on personal car use. That accounts for 90% of the total social care and health um, travel claims. It also accounts for the majority of claimed miles within Monmouthshire County Council as well. The distribution within social um, care and health means that an increased mileage pen benefit would benefit increased mileage payment would in benefit those who are at the lower grades, which are grades D, D through to F. We also need to consider our own position as a council. In terms of our ability to provide services, we need to understand that we are struggling both to recruit and retain staff for social care and health work particularly in domiciliary care. After an ill-managed hard Brexit, born out of bravado and failure to plan for the UK economy and employment market, the UK is now at full employment with extreme pressures on workers to maximise their earnings to survive the inflation that they're experiencing. We as a council are demonstrably struggling to fill lower bands domiciliary care roles and our exit interviews are now starting to report reasons for living which include a need to work closer to home and, and leaving for better pay. This isn't just a singular issue within Monmouthshire. 
councils across the Gwent region are experiencing similar issues and have responded accordingly. This paper explores options which would allow us to come in line with our sister councils that we do sometimes compete with directly for local people resources. And so the paper which I support and I would ask you as the cabinet to support would release funding from reserves to allow me as the cabinet member, along with our officers for finance and people and for finance and people and governance, to utilise that funding again of £219,824 and and to implement a package which will address the cost of living stresses for our most affected in our workforce and hopefully secure our retention and recruitment rates. Therefore, we could stand a better chance of fulfilling our care obligations to the community. The paper, as you will have seen, has costed for arrangements, which it would include a 5% increase on miles uh, or mileage payment for all MCC staff. So that would raise from the standard HMRC rate of 45 pence per mile to 50 pence per mile. We've also costed for that to be extended to commissioned staff to 50 pence per mile as well. We've also costed one pound per hour increase for commissioned carers over six months, which would complement the pay offer brought forward by the Welsh Government for staff. We also looked at the improvement of our expense module and commensurate training for the workforce that administrate that in our payment system, which would allow us to pay expenses more frequently than our current monthly approach, which would then improve cash flow directly for our workers and their families. That is the sum of the paper, which I would ask you to support. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'd open this up for comment and questions, and I turn first to um, Councillor Taylor as the leader of uh, the independent group who submitted a question yesterday. You probably want to ask it yourself, Francis. Um, thank you very much, um, uh, Councillor Brocklesby. Um, yeah, I, I, I was slightly perplexed when I read the paper because obviously, as you clarified there, this uplift is for all staff, but there was a lot of discussion about lower banded staff and targeting and um, I, I was just wanting to clarify that this is for all our staff, because then it also talks about the fact that there will be more detail to follow. So it, it wasn't 100% clear to me in the report, and it would be really helpful to just clarify those that, that point. So is it for all uh, council staff? Um, I understand what you're talking about, about the lower banded staff and absolutely support the fact that our carers are in particular uh, domiciliary care workers are amongst the lowest paid staff. Um, and that is undoubtedly a burden on them, you know, in terms of their private use of vehicle. But we're putting this right across the council. So I was welcome just a bit of an, an analysis of that, if possible. And when do you anticipate us having the detail because you, you're suggesting that there may be some changes to the way that this is distributed in in the in the paper so those were my uh, two questions and and just as a comment finally i think um you know one completely acknowledges the cost of living crisis but i think to suggest that a five pence uplift um is going to mitigate against that wholeheartedly for our lower banded staff may be a slight stretch but there we are thank you very much yeah, we can't claim to be solving the issue, but we are doing what we can. And that five that five pence per mile would bring us in line with our sister councils as well. It's it's a Gwent wide response. Um, in terms of that, I did try to incorporate some of that in my presentation. So it is across the board five pence per mile uplift for all staff on the rate. What our analysis shows is that the majority of mileage is claimed by our band D's, I believe, staff principally. Um, there is some in, and uh, we also have a higher level than that standard in band E and band F. So what we're seeing is most of that financial pressure wrapped up in personal car use and that mileage rate is principally focused 
on the lower banding staff. So increasing the mileage gives a fair rise for everybody who is also who are all facing this cost of living um, crisis, but principally bolsters those that need it most and are essentially at this point in time paying to work through um, in advance and then claiming expenses. So whilst we're not changing the levels for individual bands, the application of this across all of the bands principally gives you an outcome on the main car user, personal car users who are bands D, E and F and principally within social care and health. Does that answer? Yes, I, I, I think so. I was just trying to understand the, 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 the you know, yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, Councillor Garrick. Are you able Did to I answer all of your questions there? Sorry, if you're sorry, if you're able to say anything about, you know, because there was an indication in there that there would be more detail to come. If you're able to indicate that time frame, that would be really Absolutely, helpful. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, um, facilitating the payment system requires um, um, some improvement or the use of a new module within our payment system to allow weekly or more uh, frequent payments from monthly. So the anticipated time for that, and it is in flight at the moment, is mid-October. Thank you. I think the issue of um, having the envelope, uh, Councillor Taylor, and this would uh, apply to everybody here, is that the situation now is so volatile and so dynamic that to be prescriptive when we don't know the outcome um, of the economic situation, it's predicted to get far worse. We're predicted to go into recession. But equally, we don't know the package that the new government, well, the new prime minister and her cabinet will determine. So it's ensuring that we ring fence within an envelope and that, of course, we have to report back as soon as both officers and Rachel are clear that the best way to support our workers um, that recognising that we are in a very limited position as um, Councillor Garrick said. Mm. Um, I'd like to bring in Tudor here. Yes, uh, thanks and you know <coughs> I, I want to come in obviously as, as, as the cabinet lead for um, social services and health. Um, I commend the decision. It, it's not a question. I've just really got to say that obviously domiciliary care in particular, you know, they have no choice. They do not have the luxury of working from home. You cannot offer support to elderly or frail people um, at a distance on, on the computer. So they have to make use of their own car and obviously they have to purchase a car in the first instance to actually undertake their duties, which, which is a major uh, investment for most people, but particularly for people on a lower income. And also it means that their cars wear out more quickly uh, so that anything that we can do to mitigate that, I think, is is to be commended. And certainly having come off a, a WLGA um, meeting this afternoon with all sort of cabinet leads and professionals in the care sector, recruitment and retention is a huge issue across Wales. I'm sure it's across England as well uh, in terms of social care and, and, and health. And, and the other thing I would say is it's crucial to bring in an, a newer system of swifter payments. If you're on a high salary and you have some money washing about in your account at the end of, of the month, then yes, you could afford to wait that month. Uh, for payment of mileage. But if, if you're not, then obviously that really puts a pressure uh, on your budget. And obviously care, domiciliary care workers are at very much at the lower end of the income scale. And, and also, you know, they're being offered higher wages by retailers like Lidl, Aldi, etc., where they travel to one location, do an eight or nine hour shift without, without too much stress and then go home and they have one base. Domiciliary workers are traveling all the time. So I really commend this and I hope it, it will, to a certain degree, mitigate uh, the circumstances that those people find themselves in that might help us in terms of recruitment and, and retention. Thank you, Dior. Thanks, uh, Councillor Thomas Tudor. Um, is there any more observations or questions? Catherine, Councillor Fuchs. 
Thank you, um, Lisa. Yeah, I just wanted to um, reassure um, Councillor Taylor, though I'm, I'm sure you, you know anyway, um, Councillor Taylor, that the cost of living and our response to it is really high on our agenda. And as Cabinet Member for Poverty, Inequality and Engagement, we're working really hard on this um, as our officers. And one of the things you'll all be pleased to hear um, is that we the Money Matters programme um, instigated by um, uh, Jude Langdon and Ryan Coleman and so on, and the people in that department uh, is going to be rolled out as well to staff and staff are going to be uh, there are going to be mini roadshows and um, definitely work around ensuring staff have the support that they need. So I just wanted to reassure everyone on that. This is obviously um, Councillor Garrick's portfolio dealing with the, the expenses and the finance side of it, but there's an awful lot of work going on um, and it's a big priority for us the cost of living crisis that we will be definitely coming back to. Thank you. Thanks, um, Councillor Fuchs. Um, just for the record, uh, Money Matters programme was developed under the last administration and is one that we will carry forward um, because it does work and we recognise it does so. Um, is there any more observations? You're welcome to make an observation, uh, Councillor John, even though you didn't put in a question, should you so wish. <laughs> um, th thank you. No, I'm I'm happy with um, I, um, the, the, the question that Councillor Taylor asked and um, I haven't got any further questions, but th thank you for recognising it as the continuation of the scheme from the, from the previous administration. Thank you. Credit where credit's due, Councillor John. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would say, uh, just in quickly summing up before uh, we go to a, a vote as to whether we approve this, that um, we are looking at this in the round. And in a sense, it's when when you're caught in a, on an aeroplane and things are looking very dodgy, down come the oxygen mask. You put it on your staff first to make sure that you are supporting them so we can keep those vital services going. But equally, we are working in tandem to make sure with all our partners um, across the county and our partners more widely in Wales and the UK to find ways in which we can alleviate um, the worst and most negative impacts of the cost of living crisis, particularly on the most vulnerable in um, Monmouthshire, that recognise that not only do we have to protect people from the crisis that we're facing, but we also have to find preventative measures and promote greater resilience. And those, those different packages will take longer to develop. Uh, we're doing some work through the working groups, as you probably know, um, but we need to think very carefully and very strategically uh, how we can best position ourselves and leverage support and funds from elsewhere to maximise what we can do. So this is the start of what will be a very difficult winter, but also the start of a very focused approach by uh, the Cabinet um, and I hope the whole of Council in how we can support the people that we work with and the people that live in Monmouthshire. Um, so if we're going to seek to decide what we will do as regards this particular report where uh, Councillor Gareth along with uh, the officers are asking for approval to release the reserve funding to mitigate um, the workforce impact of the current cost of living crisis and could we um, have a show of hands as to whether or not we're going to approve this cabinet? Thank you, that's approved. So, that's quite a sobering item. Um, we're now going to bring on, uh, move on to the next item, which is our return to the school transport policy, which becomes even more important in these testing times. So I'm going to hand it over to um, Councillor Grocart. Uh, uh, thank you, Leader. The, um, 
The hoped for outcome here is quite a simple one. It asks you to note this report. Uh, and the reason for that is that those with long memories will remember back in June when uh, we first considered this, the cabinet should have made a decision today uh, uh, on, on the school transport policy for the coming year. The reason for that is that we have a statutory duty to publish that policy by the 1st of October each year. And this would have been the last cabinet meeting to enable us to do that. However, the reason that I am asking for a delay and indeed for an extension of the consultation period uh, is that the um, select committee has asked if I can go along and answer questions at the select committee on the 27th of September. And I'm more than happy to do that. As, a, as an administration, uh, I think you'll agree, Leader, that we have made it clear that we think that scrutiny has an important part to play. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, I was more than happy to agree uh, that I go along, and this was discussed at our last cabinet meeting, an agreement that that new timescale would come in. So instead of coming to a decision today, I am merely reporting where we are. And the first thing is that the period of consultation can now extend to the 16th of September because we're not coming to a decision today. Uh, and one of the main benefits of that is that it enables schools as organisations and their governing bodies to comment rather than simply individuals being allowed to comment during the summer holiday period. So that's a very real positive. It also uh, enables scrutiny committee to um, look at this in detail. Then the final point I would make is that in order to then meet our statutory responsibility of publishing a policy by the 1st of October, is that the day after it goes to scrutiny on the 27th of this month, I need to work with my officer, Deb Hill Howells, to come to a single member policy decision on the outcome, the, 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 the final policy for the coming school year. It will, it will become the policy that people who will go through the process at the end of this school year to apply for next school year will go through. There was some discussion around the efficacy of that, if you like, um, because it won't, there will be no further discussion within Cabinet. But I would point out that scrutiny is live streamed. You will see everything that is said. So uh, if, if I try to claim anything that has not been said in committee, uh, that will, the, the evidence will be there for all to see. So it will be open, it will be transparent, uh, and because there will be a longer period of consultation, I think hopefully um, a period of consultation that gets a fuller response. It would have been a very short consultation period as a result of um, the process not being able to start pre-election. Uh, and, and I think that with the possible sole downside, that the decision is made by a single cabinet member rather than the cabinet itself. Uh, I think that's the only possible downside. But I think the positives in terms of scrutiny and greater transparency outweigh that. So uh, I am asking colleagues in Cabinet to note the report, to welcome the fact that uh, a scrutiny committee wants to look at this uh, and allow me to make a single member decision on the 28th of September. So we meet our statutory deadline for publication on the 1st of October. Thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, and I'm glad you laid it out in this way because I think it's extremely important that we have these mechanisms of accountability and we follow it through. And as uh, Councillor Fuchs has been working 
um, tirelessly since May to start thinking in fresh ways about how we can improve our engagement and consultation processes. It's good to see that we're extending that process and recognising that there are many different actors involved in different uh, policies and this one includes students themselves, governing bodies, teachers, as well as parents. So I'm glad we have opened it up from what was initially, and thank goodness you noted that, uh, a far too short consultation period for that to happen. I know um, Councillor Taylor has a question that she would like to ask, and then I will in encourage anyone to have a further questions or observations. Please go ahead, Councillor Taylor. Um, thank you. <clears throat> I note in the report that um, the there were a number of responses, obviously it doesn't quantify how many, which um, qu queried the policy on post-16 transport and, and, and the way we operate that. So firstly, I wondered, is the, is the decision to offer concession, con concession, I can't say that, concessionary travel on routes there, where Councilor there are Taylor. empty seats based principally on cost? That, that's the first part of my question. And then secondly, we've just been speaking about the cost of living crisis and the cost of living uh, crisis that may also very much affect parents who have to pay uh, for those concessionary travel places. And um, I wondered if there was an evaluation of the post-16 policy in respect of both actually cost of living and the climate emergency. So thinking in particular of um, what um, one of my colleagues in the independent group was talking about, because those those young people will still have to travel. Mm -hmm. we, we, if they don't get a bus, you know, will that mean that they have to get there by other means, which you know may have a negative impact both on, um, you know, their parents uh, be, be, being able to manage to keep them in education, but also on the environment. So mm -hmm. there's two two parts to that question. If that's okay. Yeah, certainly. Um, we have a legal duty to provide home to school transport for those learners who meet the eligibility criteria. And these are set out in, in the learner travel measure. Uh, every year we review our routes and the vehicle sizes based on the number of learners that are entitled to free transport. While we always try to minimise the number of vacant seats, they will inevitably arise. Uh, and then these seats are offered to learners who don't meet the eligibility criteria, but have applied to access transport. Uh, it might be, for example, they're not attending their nearest catchment school or, as you say, they're post-16 learners. So while the ability to recoup some funding towards the cost of the provision of transport is welcome, it's actually the demand from parents for concessionary travel that has led the approach. And then in terms of post-16, because um, this has been a very contentious area, uh, and in fact it's an area that we await more guidance from the Welsh Government, who uh, undertook a review of elements of school transport, and post-16 was one of those. So it may be that when we start this year's consultation in a few months' time, the ground rules will have actually been altered by the world government. But from where we are at present, um, you asked if there was an evaluation of the post-16 policy uh, in respect to the climate emergency and the cost of living factors, because as a, as a new administration, we are pledged always to, to take those things into account. So um, members will be aware that the learner travel measure is statutory legislation uh, and the Welsh Government have recently concluded a consultation progress regarding travel for post-16 and indeed for nursery. Uh, when the Welsh Government finalised their review and confirmed their position on post-16 travel, it will form part of our next review of transport policy to ensure that they align. Our current policy is that post-16 learners are given priority over any vacant seats to support their continued learning. The cost of their concessionary travel may be reduced 
if the parents are in receipt of benefit payments. We would normally expect a, a payment of £440 a year. As our policies are already in excess of the statutory requirements, for example, on distance criteria, we don't wish to make any further changes until we've got clarity with the Welsh Government. Um, but certainly, one of the, I think that that next review, we will have to walk a tightrope because on the one hand, um, we want to encourage post-16 education. Um, in all probability, it will become part of the statutory duty. Um, but we don't know that yet. And um, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, um, yeah, free school meals pupils post-16, the leader has pointed out, do already receive uh, free transport. Mm. Um, but we need to balance encouraging youngsters to stay on at school and to travel to school while at the same time trying to reduce the number of vehicles we've got streaming around the county belching out carbon twice a day getting kids to and from school it's going to be a very difficult thing to to align that together because we are, uh, we also need to bear in mind the travel to Welsh medium education and to faith-based education. Um, and, and sometimes the travel distances there for post-16 are quite considerable. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm not issuing that as any sort of veiled threat or anything like that, don't get me wrong, but just simply say it. That to say, yes, we'll, you know, it, it, the easiest thing in the world is to say we'll cover all travel costs. We really do need to look at the amount of carbon we are burning, getting children to and from their places of learning, as well as their right to get them there. Yeah, just clarify a point. Uh, yes, you. Um, just, to, just to clarify, sorry, the... the the post-16 is not part of the statutory... No, um, not at the moment, at the minute, yes. but we suspect so, that it, it will become. So at the present time, then, the answer is because I, I, there isn't, you know, we, are, we aren't making any, we haven't made an assessment of, of our policy against um, either climate or cost of living at the present time. No, because the policies that have so far been approved were the consultations that took place Last under year. the previous administration. I think I was just trying to understand in my own mind, because I understand what you're saying about getting people to and from, but if you're going on as part of a collective transport on a bus, for example, then theoretically, or in practical terms, that is less uh, carbon heavy than mm, a number a number of people all taking their individual vehicles or driving there so so it's you know so I appreciate that it's always a balance but I was also mindful of the fact that um, you know as the leader points out people on preschool meals can access free uh, transport however the level at which one accesses free school meals you know that the, the, the income threshold is very low and um, we will see many more families who are on what we would otherwise have described as average or, you know, above average incomes, struggling with the cost of everything that they need to pay. Mm. And therefore, the, 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 the difficulty of paying extra things such as um, for, for post-16 transport yeah. may indeed become... You, 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 you're a, quite a right. As, as a governor of one of our secondary schools, Sorry, our, our free school you, meal you. percentage has got to a limit we've never seen before, yeah. as, ha, as have our post-16 numbers, and the two are, are, are going to intermesh, aren't they? And you're quite right, if we're not going to lose those six formers, which we don't want to do, then there's going to be mm. a dilemma. Um, Thank you. Do we have any anyone from the screen? OK. Um, Councillor Grokert is asking us to note this report, and I think uh, Councillor Taylor has raised a very important point. I can see Sarah, Councillor Birch is there. Do you, do you want to chip in, Sarah? 
just to say that um, France, Francis raises very good, very good point. In the long term, we would like to see more young people who are of an age to do so um, cycling to school along along active travel routes and um, and being able to access um, public public transport. But um, in the meantime, I very much welcome this. Uh, uh, this report. The most important thing, I think, as a parent um, on a, um, a limited budget is to make sure that you have certainty um, over your transport arrangements to school um, and know from one year to another where you are. And I hope, I think this will, uh, this gives people that. Thanks, uh, Councillor Birch. And I see um, Councillor Thomas Tudor. Come in, Tudor. Microphone. Yes, sorry, th thanks for that, Leader. Um, yes, I, I very much welcome this report, um, but also I, I, I certainly, from, from what um, Councillor Marty Groker has said, that, that the possibility that Welsh Government might change their minds in terms of post-16, oh. it does mitigate against people who are on a lower income when you're paying four or five hundred pounds per pupil. Uh, and we live in a very rural authority, so lots of children live a good few miles away from uh, their school at, at both primary and particularly secondary. Uh, but also it mitigates against Welsh medium because uh, the two Welsh medium provisions that we use, the one in, in Newport, um, a school in East Coed and a school in Gwynllu, they're both many miles away and, and you have to use uh, transport. You, I'm afraid, however active the travel route is, you can't cycle easily to, to Gwynshaw and then do your A-levels and then come back uh, and be alive. Uh, but I, I very much hope that in the future that will change and that obviously we would then revisit. But I, I certainly welcome this interim report and, and the fact it's going to be a, a longer consultation um, period because it's very important that parents do uh, give their views on this very, very important transport issue. And having had three kids, two of them in Welsh medium, had to travel, you know, the cost is quite significant, but it's, it's obviously much worse if you're on a low income. Thanks. Thanks, Judah. We're asked to um, note this um, interim report, which I, unless anyone anyone here has uh, wants to raise an objection, I think we'll go forward to it. But I, I think the thing to remember is one it is interim, there is more discussion, but it will be under review for the, the next year uh, when we are facing a very difficult year and to remind <coughs> ourselves that while councils think in terms of policies and directorates, people don't, people think in the whole and they will be juggling between where they save on food, where they save on transport, where they save on not going to that gym club with their kids and whatever. And that when we respond to the cost of living crisis, we're responding to people, not services. Our services have to adapt to that way of thinking in a holistic way and recognise that this is one piece of a, a very complicated, um, three-dimensional, almost Harry Potter-like jigsaw that we have to grapple with over the next uh, year. Um, so can we note that and carry on? Before I close the meeting, um, I'd like to take a moment and I would welcome contributions from um, both Councillor John and Councillor Taylor to um, remember and honour um, Councillor Bob Greenland. Um, I didn't know him because, uh, as you know, I didn't really work in Wales till May, but I did go to his funeral and I was incredibly moved by the contributions of his family and by Peter Fox and uh, Mr. Blair, who's not Tony, forgive me, and by the people that I met afterwards, because they painted a picture of a man of so many talents, so very rounded and rich in his life experience, who had devoted so much of his life to public service. 
And from that perspective, while we may not have shared, I have no idea actually, we may not have shared politics, that sense of duty, that sense of willingness to engage and to be accountable to people in Monmouthshire surely has to be a model that all of us as councillors would want to emanulate in our own way. I've got that word wrong, apologies. But I, I'd just like to put that on record and also mark that it is a loss to the council. He was a bit large figure and did play an enormous part in the council during his time here. So on that note, I'd like to close the meeting and thank you all for coming. Richard, I was going to say, do you want, do you want him to say anything? Yeah. Richard seemed very quiet. I know. Sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't realise you, you were waiting for people to raise their hands. Sorry. Sorry. Um, th thank you for those, for those comments, um, Mariana. I thought that was, that was really thoughtful. And I, I feel, I feel sorry for all the new members that you, you haven't had the chance to, to, properly get to know Bob and to to see him in his prime because um, he was a fantastic councillor and as as someone who was elected for the first time in 2017 I really looked up to Bob he was a really fatherly figure particularly for for me and Sarah who were new members of the cabinet in in 2017 and he was so supportive of us and to see him in his prime debating with um of, often with with dimitri or with or with armand or um a, a, others on the other side of the chamber sometimes it would it would get quite heated but it was always respectful and he was so admired across the chamber um he was a massive figure in in not just the council but in in the region um he was the one of the founding um, directors of the Education Achievement Service, our, our school improvement partners. Um, he played a, a big role in the, the Welsh Local Government Association and also when the Cardiff Capital Region city deal was was first set up. Um, he was um, the chairman of the um, compound semiconductor foundry in, in Newport um he was respected uh, across gwent and on the on the regional stage for the the work he did he had a razor sharp wit he was always good company um he could amend a motion within an inch of its life uh and um you know, would 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 in, he could be combative at at times in in the chamber but it was always respectful like um labor conservative independent whatever we would all leave that chamber and and people just had so much respect for him um he had been instrumental in so many of the major decisions that had been made in this council over the last um decade and a half you know he was first elected in 2004 joined the cabinet in 2006 um he then became deputy leader in 2008 and served as deputy leader up until up until may um he was instrumental in the um uh, purchase and setting up of the new cattle market near raglan which was a massive success it was really controversial moving it from abergavenny at the time but the the redevelopment of abergavenny that 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 move has has allowed has been a massive success and um and the the pedestrianization the Abergavenny is a town that's really thriving and Bob was instrumental to that um during the pandemic he was a really proactive cabinet member in uh, setting up the business resilience forum and making sure that the the voice of businesses was heard um and so many of the regeneration and investment decisions that have been taken over the last decade and a half you know bob was absolutely at the at the heart of that so the residents of monmouthshire really owe bob a, a debt of gratitude and um the, it, it's impossible to overstate the contribution 
he's made to this council, but um, from the Conservative group and his friends, and he had many friends in, in the, 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 the Labour and Independent groups as well. Um, he's just going to be desperately missed. You know, he was he was such a good friend and, and supporter of us, and um, we will miss him desperately. Our thoughts, obviously, with, with his wife, Scylla, um, his children and grandchildren, um, but we will just really miss his his wisdom and um, his his humour. Um, we had some um, fantastic times as a as a cabinet. I really enjoyed his his company, and I I felt I learned so much from him. Um, we um, you know we. We were we were a close team as a both as a cabinet but also as a group, and um, Bob was always someone you could go to for advice. So, a couple of days ago, when I had a meeting with Mary Ann and with Paul about about the LDP, the first person I would turn to talk to about the LDP and ask for advice would would have been Bob. And um, so many of us are really going to miss. Um, really going to miss him and the 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 advice and the support that that he provided and um he was just a, a key member of our group and we're, we're going to miss him desperately thank you richard i can really hear the loss mm. thank you for sharing that with us and thank you I, I would just add, I think it's very thoughtful of you to mention that, um, Councillor Brocklesby, but I, I think that uh, whilst I was certainly not part ever of the Conservative group, um, Bob was a, a really, really important figure to this council and is a huge loss. And I personally knew I, I got on very well with Bob and um, spent quite a bit of time with him, fortunately, because I used to do the inductions for all the new staff and I used to do them on my own and then um, uh, Bob joined me because he decided he'd quite like to so we used to uh, as a double act talk about the role of an elected member to every new staff who, uh, staff member who joined and um, as, as Richard just mentioned you know if you can't amend a motion like Bob then you can't amend a motion until you learn how to do it um, as well as Bob then you, you haven't cracked the, 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 the kind of art of amendments and so and he was a real master at it and I don't know how you know his mind was just so quick at thinking how he could bring it but we, we didn't agree we most certainly didn't agree on many things including the M4 relief road it has to be said um, and we had great debates but they were as you say respectful and honest and um, probably one of the greatest uh, compliments I've had from uh, a member of a in a different political group is Bob said to me that um, in his view, I was an excellent local member. And I think from Bob, that was a compliment indeed, because uh, he didn't, I don't think he gave compliments easily to, um, certainly not to, to members of other political groups, but no, he did, because he, I think he did see things on their merits. So to be fair, I, um, I really always enjoyed Bob's company and I, I was very sorry not to be able to attend his funeral, but um, David um, Jones attended on behalf of our group. So, as you say, Richard, um, he, he will be sorely missed um, at this council. Thank you, Francis. Well, I'm really encouraged that I've got bedtime YouTube listening so I can discover the art of amending. <laughs> you, you really do need to listen to a couple of Bob's amendments because they are really just the stuff of legend. So certainly if you go, you know, probably into the last council, I would say, probably before you joined actually, Richard, when before we had the pandemic and everything. Yes, definitely a, a something if you were uh, if you if you want to if you want to learn about amendments, it's probably a good place to start. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, I think with, with those two very touching and moving contributions from both Councillor John and Councillor Taylor, it is now time to close the meeting and thank you very much everyone for coming, officers and uh, councillors. See you all soon. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lida. Take care, everyone. Yeah, thanks.
Thanks. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Can I ask you a question?